Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. One of the things that energizes us the most is being able to hear the stories of lives that are impacted by Jesus Christ. We would love for you to share your story with us. You can share your story by sending it to stories at visaliafirst.com. Or maybe your next step with getting connected to what God is doing here in our ministry is partnering with us financially. You can do that by heading over to visaliafirst.com slash give and finding the giving option that works best for you. Thanks again so much for tuning in today and enjoy today's message. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I feel something in this room this morning. I believe we're on the verge of something. And that little video you just saw was about a lot of past revivals that have happened in, in America. You know, the Bible says in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your young men shall see vision. Your old men shall dream dreams. I'll pour it out on handmaidens. I'll pull out on servant people. I'll pull it out, pour it out on animals. <laughs> There is going to be a move of God in these last days that is going to light your flame, baby. <laughs> We've had all kinds of revivals in America. Ever since America has been here, there's been revivals all the way back to the 1700s. Crazy revivals. They shut down New York City during lunch hour just so people could feel the churches. Wouldn't that be a nice thing to happen today if they shut down New York one more time and revival broke out? Azusa Street. Power of God hit Azusa Street so strong that uh, Brother Seymour, the pastor, he, he didn't know what to do with it. He would put a shoebox over his head. He was afraid of the power of God because it was so thick and so real. Have you ever had a personal experience where you said, man, I, be, I believe I too have been revived? Have you ever had a personal revival? I remember... Um, one time I was visiting a church in Brazil. You know, you know that uh, Christos, that, um, that big, big giant Jesus up the top of Sugarloaf? Anybody ever been there? Um, I was just cutting up with one of my preacher buddies one day. We went up that mountain. We wanted to check it out and get a picture by the Christos. But I didn't know they had a little Catholic church in the bottom of that statue. It didn't have but about three rows of chairs. And I looked at my buddy. I said, you think they'll let us in there? being Protestant and all. He said, let's try it. Went up to the front door. The ladies was really, really nice. She said, go on in. I walked in. I sat down on a pew and, and I have yet to feel the presence of God like I felt in that place that day. That challenged all of my theology. Here I am in a Catholic church experiencing the presence of God. <laughs> but you know what? There was a big move of God in the 1960s on the East Coast in Pittsburgh. The, the, there was a college that started reading David Wilkerson's book on the cross and the switchblade, and they started prayer meetings, and the power of God hit that Catholic college. It moved all the way up and down the East Coast, and it gave birth to the charismatic renewal in the 60s and 70s. I don't know about you, but I'm getting hungry for a new move of God in my life. <laughs> You know, if, if, if we get into revival and I'm full on believing that this church is moving into a whole nother dimension and I believe that miracles are going to break forth, I believe that people are going to be saved that never could be saved. <laughs> and, but you know, there's problems that come with revival. You just got to know that right off the bat. A lot of people so long for revival, they'll, they'll go back to an old revival and try to duplicate what God did a few years back. Well, oh, back in the early days in America, there was this one move of God that came on the Quakers. And it was so strong that these Quakers would come under the power of God and they would just shake. They started calling them the, 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 the shaking Quakers. And then the movement finally became known as the shaking enlightenment movement. Because people would go to church and they would just experience the shaking, the, this power of God would come on them. It would be wrong for you and I to make an idol out of that. Go back and say, you know what? If we'll start shaking, maybe a little, get a little shaking going on here. Maybe God will move. No, 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 no. I'm looking for a brand new thing that God is doing. The Bible said he's new every morning. I'm not looking to make a new, uh, a new revival out of something old. I, I want God to show up in Visalia. I want God to show up in the Central Valley. I want, I want this place to be talked about because that's the second problem you get when revival breaks out. Number one, we make an idol out of old moves. But number two, sometimes we get talked about. 
Now, if you don't want to get talked about, you just don't need to do anything. I mean, there's not many people talking about the homeless lady. She's got one sock up and one sock down. She's pushing her buggy. Nobody talking about her because nobody knows her. Once you do something, you get to be known. People will start talking about you. You get a revival going on here and people will talk about you. And, and some people will even say that you're full of the devil. But that's okay with me because I, I want the move of God more than I care about what people are going to say about the move of God. The truth of the matter is you and I need a personal revival in our soul. I need it now. You need it now. I'm asking God to let Visalia first be the revival center for the Central Valley. I believe in that. I'm believing that the talk is going to happen in Bakersfield all the way to Merced. And they're going to say, if you want your miracle, why don't you go to Visalia first? There's a power of God is moving in that house. <laughs> we need, somebody say, we need a personal revival. <laughs> America needs a revival. The church needs a revival. Why don't you and I start the revival? Now, the devil, devil doesn't want you to have a revival. Matter of fact, he does not want you to understand the power of a personal revival. No, no, no. He, he does not want you to understand what a revival can do to your family, what a revival can do to your finances, what a revival can do to your wife and your husband. No, 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 no. He has worked too long to steal, kill, and destroy. He cannot afford for you to have a revival. You know, when Jesus showed up, revival could break out in a second. Jesus was walking beside a graveyard one day and somebody jumped out the grave. Y'all read your Bible. You, you talk about, it. I mean, when Jesus was resurrected and he came back on the earth, the Bible says that people, people unloaded a graveyard in Jerusalem. You say, ooh, that's pretty freaky, Brother Mike. Revival is freaky. Come on. Jesus was walking into the city of Nain one day, and he, there was this woman coming out of the, uh, uh, the, there was a funeral procession coming out of town, and there was this woman coming out, and, and all of a sudden, uh, Jesus walked up, and he realized this is the only son of this widow woman. Jesus laid his hand on the coffin. That boy shot up out of that coffin and started talking to the pallbearers. Now, that's revival right there. <laughs> Jesus walked up to a dead girl one day and said, tell it the coon. <laughs> she jumped up too. I'm talking about that kind of revival where the impossible becomes possible when that which we believe has finally happened. <laughs> I want to take you to Nehemiah chapter 4 because they're having a little revival in this town. It's a little different, uh, but I want to use this to talk to you about a personal revival yourself. Because the same questions that the enemy asked Nehemiah's bunch is the same question the enemy's putting on you and me today. Nehemiah chapter four, verse one, new, good news translation. When Sanballat heard that we Jews had begun rebuilding the wall, he became furious. The enemy doesn't like it when you get a move of God going on. He became furious and began to ridicule us. In front of his companions and the Samaritan troops, he said, now these are the, I'm going to deal with five questions right here. Sanballat said, what do these miserable Jews think they're doing? <laughs> Number two, do they intend to rebuild the city? Mm. Do they think by offering sacrifices they can finish the work in one day? Can they make building stones out of this heap of burnt rubble? Tobiah was standing there beside him and added, what kind of wall could they ever build? Even a fox could knock down that wall. Mm -mm -mm. Somebody say, thank God for his word. Now, for you that are not familiar with this text, there was an ongoing hatred with Israel and their enemies around them. The people of Ashdod, the people of Amnon, the, the, the Arab people that were south of them and, and the people in Babylon known as Iraq today, there was just hatred all the time. Mm. They, were, they, they had literally dragged people out of Jerusalem. When, when Babylon came over there in 584 BC, they sacked the city. What that meant was they took 90% of the people out of the city 
they left 10% in the city so the wild animals wouldn't overrun the city. And they carted them off to Babylon. And then they would set the city on fire. Now, I've always bothered me why you would set a, a stone city on fire, but this is what they did. And these people had been in captivity for 70 years. Most of them that had left Jerusalem have already died. Only a handful of the very old guys, and they've been telling these young guys, we can't wait till we get back to our beloved Jerusalem. Man, the grapes in the valley of Estol, man, they're so big. Oh, the milk and the honey. I can't wait to go and get me some of that sweet milk and honey and everything, all that captivity we've been in for these 70 years, boys. You, you're going to forget about all this because when we get to Jerusalem, everything is going to be all right. <laughs> but when they arrived in Jerusalem, it wasn't as the old guys said. The smell of smoke was still in the air. They were exhausted from being in slavery. And now they've come to a situation that their heart has sunk because it is nothing like they remembered it. The town had been burnt with fire. It's one thing to start over when you're feeling strong. It's one thing to start over when you got great resources and good accommodation, but it's a whole nother thing when you have to start over from the point of utter defeat. That's who we're dealing with here. These people are dejected. They thought getting out of slavery was gonna be so much. They come home and their morale is on the bottom. And then here comes this fellow by the name of Nehemiah. He's not a preacher. Matter of fact, he was the cupbearer to the king Artaxerxes. Basically meant before the king drank a glass of wine that the cupbearer had to taste it to make sure there wasn't any poison in it. Mm, I don't know if I'd want that job. <laughs> um, but he talked the king into helping him rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, he was bringing resources with him, but when he shows up, he looks at these people and his heart is broken, not only for the broken city, but the broken people. But he wasn't going to start with their level. He was trying to bring them up to their level. He's trying to pre he is passing out optimism like crazy. He's saying, boy, we can fix these walls. We can change this thing. And he's starting to stir up trouble everywhere because of his optimism. You know, a good leader filled with the Holy Spirit will get on your nerves sometimes. Not our leader, but sometimes... <laughs> He is challenging them to do something that their circumstance said they could not do. Oh, if I had somebody of faith in this room today, I could preach to you a little bit because God is always challenging you to do something that your circumstances has said you could not do. Your circumstances is lying to you. You can build that building. You can buy that house. You can start that business. Your children are coming home to be with the Lord. And then the enemy shows up and turns up the heat a little bit. And you know, Sanballat and Tobiah, when they show up, they always start with words. I mean, they started going around the wall and they started discouraging these wore out Jewish people. And uh, they started with words. Well, what do you people think you're doing? Uh, you know, the enemy works like that. I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but you got to watch the chatter of the enemy because the ear is the gateway to the soul. If the soul gets poisoned, the spirit will be downcast. So you got to be careful what you're listening to. That's why I don't watch news much anymore. I don't, I don't listen to talk radio anymore. Why? I'm tired and tired of... If I'm going to turn something on, I'm going to turn on some praise and worship or some good old preaching or something. Why? Because I want the chatter going in this gate to come down into this soul. And so when you see me, my soul is on fire. It's not down in the dumps because I've been listening to too much junk. So I got off there a little bit. Where am I, fellas? 
The enemy turns up the heat and the enemy says this and that. So the enemy poses five questions. I got five questions here. Uh, that's, they, they have five questions to stop this seven letter word revival. I want you to write in that little blank there, the word revival. Somebody say revival. revival. Write down the word revival and circle the middle letter. Where does revival begin? Everybody say that middle letter. I got to start a revival. So I'm going to pose these five questions, the same one that the enemy posed toward Nehemiah's crowd, to you to apply personally to your personal revival. The first thing that the enemy said, what do you think you're doing? What do you think you're doing? Have you ever started to try to make a move toward God and one of your friends say, hey, hey, don't get too spiritual on me now. Or one of your family members, hey, no, 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 don't be giving that money to the Lord. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. What do you think you're doing? What do you, what do you think you're doing? Uh, and, and, and you feeble Jews, I mean, you're too feeble to do anything. And, and he didn't lie. I mean, the enemy didn't lie to them. They were feeble. The enemy always starts with something that you already believe about yourself in order to get his chatter going in your soul. How do you think you're going to buy a house when you can't even afford gas money? Well, I can't afford gas money. I've been believing God for our house. How do you think that you're ever going to please God when you got all that lust in your heart? Well, I did have lust in my heart, you know, but I, I'm still believing that God. See, you, you got this thing going on here and you've got to come to a place where you got to shut down the chatter of the devil and say, you know what? I tell you who I think I am. I think I'm the head and not the tail. I think I'm out front, not lagging behind. I think God is for me, not against me. I think greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I think God loves me. He's got a plan for my life and a purpose. That's who I think I am. What do you think you're doing? I think I'm going to get close to God. Number two, who do you think you are? Have you forgotten I own you? Boy, I had you slavery for 70 years. Young lady, I've had you bound up with that thing ever since you were 10 years of age. Do you think you're going to get out that quickly? Do you think that I'm going to let you go? You know, I, I let you have sin for a season. I let you enjoy sin for a season and have fun, but I'm coming back for payment. Do you think that I'm going to let you off? Just you want to skirt off to the church there and get filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you think I'm not going to make you pay? Who do you think you are? See, that's why we got to get more word in us so that we know, we'll start believing what God says we are, not who we say we are, not who the devil says we are. We got to get a picture of who God says we are. And God says that we are overcomers. We're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We should have a personal revival. What do you think you're doing? Who do you think you are? You know what? I may be down to nothing, but I believe God's up to something. I may be broke today, but I'm not going to be broke tomorrow. I may be feeble right now, but I feel like something's about to happen in this place. See, you got to talk your way into revival. You can't just walk around and walking around in defeat, looking at defeat, looking at defeat. You can't do that. Mm. Somebody say, I know who I am. Number three. Do you think that sacrifice of worship has any value? They, top, Tobiah said, do you really think those sacrifices you're trying to offer in here is really going to work? When you get ready to move toward God, the enemy will try to belittle your sacrifice of praise. There's no need for you to worship. There's no need to... to just, just show up, show up 30 minutes late for church and just get there for the word. See, that's the enemy. All you people that were late this morning, that's the devil. <laughs> Some of it was time change probably, but most of it's the devil. <laughs> or those devils you brought to Sunday school. I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, he has to belittle the sacrifice of praise part. The devil really has to do this. He has to belittle the sacrifice of praise part because when you start praising, oh, this is good. This is worth the gas money right here. And when you start praising God 
for something that he hasn't done yet, the enemy gets nervous because that speaks faith of him. And he knows if faith ever breaks through, he's in trouble. When you start praising God for something you can't see, the enemy gets nervous. No, 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 no. Get out of that worship service. Don't you got to go to the restroom right now? You know, your bladder's going to burst. It's probably going to pop right here in front of everybody and you're going to die on the floor. Get out of here. You shouldn't have drank all that coffee, man. What you talking about? Uh, 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 uh. But watch this. Watch this. When you praise God for something he hasn't done before, you make the devil nervous. Watch this. But when you praise God for something he's never done before, the account is unsettled. Watch this. Watch this. When I praise God for something he's already done, Lord, I thank you for helping me get into that house. Lord, I thank you. And the account is settled. God blessed me. I praised him. Account settled. Payment made. God, I thank you that you gave me a good wife and and she's in her right mind. Yes, you you prayed for a good wife. I gave you a good wife. She's in her right mind. You praised me. Account settled. But when I start praising God for something that has not happened yet, Lord, I thank you. The the doctor told me that I have cancer, but Lord, I'm praying. I, I believe that you can heal all cancer. Matter of fact, Lord, it's not my cancer. I don't even know how it got in my body. It's just a, it's just a foreign agent. It's a, it's a, a dweller that shouldn't be there. Uh, I don't know how it got in there, Lord, but right now I'm praising you ahead of time for healing me of this cancer. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Now the count, the account is unsettled. Now you've given God praise for something he hasn't done. You've given him some layaway praise. Y'all remember layaway? Mama go down there, couldn't afford Christmas, so she'd put something on layaway. She put a little money on it. Mama had some investment in that, but mama would come back one day and get her layaway for her kids. So when you praise God for something he, Lord, I praise you that this business is going to prosper. I see it blessing missionaries all over the world. Lord, I praise you. I praise you. You're praising me for something I haven't done. And watch this. God is going to do that very thing. And let me show you why. Because the Bible says that God will be in debt to no man. You praise me and I haven't done it. Hey, boys, we got a debt to pay down there. We got to go down there and fix those boys. No, they're praising us for stuff that we haven't done yet. The account is unsettled. Somebody get down there and bless those people. Oh, somebody in here praise the Lord like you believe. (laughs) Oh, I believe this stuff, y'all. I mean, it could be raining elephants outside and I'm still believing none of us are going to be hit. (laughs) Where am I? You want to go to number four? Four? What's number four, guys? I don't know. At the end of the day, don't you know it would all be a wasted effort? Let's go to that one. At the end of the day, Don't you know it's all going to be a wasted effort? Do you fellas really think you're going to finish this wall in a day or two? Uh, You know, as lead pastor of our church here, um, the enemy talks to me all the time. Um, I so appreciate all y'all's prayers because he'd talk to me a lot more if y'all weren't praying so much. Uh, But he talks to me all the time. And here's one of the things that he's been dogging me with lately. You done went and build that building out there. Yet all these people give all that hard-earned money to build a ridiculous big building like that. Don't you know church attendance is on decline around America? Don't you know people are going to not go to church five years from now? Don't you know that the online church is going to put the physical church out of business? Don't you know that the people won't want to come to church anymore? Don't you know that building is going to be empty? And I turn around and I say, hey, 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 hey. Wait just a second. My Bible says that the glory of the latter house shall be stronger than the glory of the former house. 
I'm believing God for a revival. I'm believing God. There are more lost people in this valley that are yet to be found. I believe if we could fill it up 10 times on a week, uh, we still wouldn't be able to get everybody in there. Come on, somebody believe with me. As long as there's lost people, we're going to be able to fill the place with lost people. (laughs) Tobias said, you know, uh, let's go to number five. I'm running out of time. Can people build something out of old charred ruins? Mm. So here's what they did. When they left the town, they purposely set every building on fire. Now, wait a second. These are limestone buildings. These these buildings are stone. Who who would build a stone house? I mean, who would burn up a, a, a rock house? Very important because limestone, when you burn it, it loses its molecular activity. It, its molecules begin to break down when you put heat on these stones that they had built those walls out of. So what happened is it's like a piece of toast. You take a toast, you piece of bread, you put it in the toaster, and it's okay to a certain point, but the longer you leave it in there, what happens? It begins to crumble. It begins to get brittle, and that's why they would burn these cities, and, and so when Tobiah said, even if a fox jumped up on that wall, he could break it, because that's just those old brittle limestone. That's You boys have nothing to build with. You're building out of these old charred stones, and, 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 and I'm telling you, you're building out of the wrong material. Now, I want to switch that gear just a little bit because I know the devil talks to you when you've got out there and you had a sinful life and you did all the stupid stuff you shouldn't have done. One of the first things the devil will tell you, nobody's going to want you. You're so rotten. You're one of those old broken down stoners. Nobody wants a broken down stoner. But I'm here to tell you the devil is a liar because God does good work with fragile instruments. God specializes in building sturdy lives out of lives that were in shambles. You need to get a vision that your past, God does not reference your past in order to bless you in your future. I've been to Jerusalem. Do you know that that wall that they built is still standing today? They built, that wall should have never, but when God, somebody say, but God, But God got involved and God turned that thing around for them. Mm. Those are the five questions that will stop a seven-letter experience called revival. Let me give you three keys, rapid fire. For the Bible said in verse number nine, Nehemiah said, this is what we did. We prayed to God. They prayed to God. How many know that prayer still works? Oh, if I could ever get you to believe in prayer, uh, you could shut down the chatter in just a second if you'd just turn on some prayer. And secondly, the Bible says, what? They kept an eye on the enemy. It's almost as if they kept one eye on the enemy and one eye on the work. They had a trial in one hand and they had a sword in the other hand. That's the way you, when you, when the devil's chasing you, baby, you got to work like that. You got you to gotta be alert. You got to keep your eye. And the third thing in verse number 23, it said, they did not take their clothes off. Oh, pastor, where are you going with this one? <laughs> I mean, this enemy was so on top of them because he knew if they got those walls built in the Old Testament, the best way to, to protect yourself from outside invaders first thing you had to have is a wall around your city and the enemies around them knew if they ever got that wall built up, if they ever got revival going in there, they they would be destroyed. The the devil knows that. (laughs) And these guys, these enemies were there night and day. They said, we're going to kill you. We're going to kill you. Some guys would keep their clothes on and they would sleep next to the wall that they were rebuilding. Some people would go home, and Nehemiah said, when we went home, we wouldn't even take our clothes off. Why? Because they're alert. If they, heard the, they, if they heard the shofar and the enemy was trying to break through, that meant all of them could just jump out the house real fast, and they could take care of business. But I want to take it a little bit further, because 
What you get in the church house, what they were building on that wall, they took it home with them. What you get in church, you ought to go home. When you're in a praise service like this morning, you know what? Heaven begins to drop seeds in the womb. I love praise and worship. You know why? A praise and worship service is a seedbed for miracles. When God starts dropping seeds on you, you'll walk out of here. You go bear hunting with a switch. I mean, you are, you're, you're walking on clouds. You're thinking, man, I got my church on. And then you get home and you run into some old rusty person. Seed development is not enough. We got to have some soil development as well. It's not enough to put your kids in Sunday school class. You got to take them home and there's got to be some good soil at home to protect the good soil, the good seed they were getting at church. These guys were so into it. They, they looked the same at home as they did at work because it was all over them. We got a mission here. We got to get this wall built. Baby, you got a mission. You got to get a personal revival going on in your house and you ought to go home and say, as for me and my house, we're going to get rid of some of this junk in this house. We're going to turn down some of this worldly stuff and we're going to start building the soil in our house. We're going to develop the soil in this house. As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Oh, somebody stand up and give the Lord some praise in this house. Father, I love you this morning. Come on, somebody tell him, tell him you love him. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I give you all the honor. I give you, you walked in this room this morning, Lord. We feel your presence. We feel your divine glory. We honor you in this house, Lord. Mighty God, what a mighty God you are. What a mighty God we serve. Blessed be the name of our God. Oh, we want the enemy of our soul to know. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to let the enemies know that we're putting a notice on sin. We're putting a notice on low living. We're going to start living for God. We believe our children are coming home to know the Lord. We believe our businesses are going to prosper because God is a good God. Somebody clap your hands unto the King of Kings and Lord Most High. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit moving in this house right now. Come on, somebody clap your hands. Shake yourself up a little bit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon this place. Oh, somebody praise Him. Come on, a little bit more. A little bit of praise in this house. Blessed be your name, Lord God Almighty. The devil is a liar. The devil is alive. Ah, thank you, Lord. I want you to bow your hearts with me. I want you to close your eyes. If you're in this room right now and you don't know this Jesus we're talking about, ah, this is your moment. For the next 60 seconds, we're going to get you connected with God. If you're here and you say, I'm away from God, Pastor, I need God. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I don't know if I'm born again. Ah, my life is miserable. I don't have any power that you're talking about. I need God, Pastor. Some of you are watching me online. You need God. You need this prayer. You need to give, give heaven an invitation to be a part of your life. They're just waiting for your invitation. You don't have to come to the front of the church, but I want to know if you're standing out there this morning. You say, Pastor, I got to get right with God right now. Just throw your hand up in the air. We're going to pray. Yes, yes, yes. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Let's pray it all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, lady. Let's all together pray this prayer. If you're online and you pray this prayer, this is how we get right with God. Let's pray it together. Lord Jesus, I invite you to be Lord of my life. From this day forward, I want to walk with God. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Take these sins away. Take this guilt out of me. You died for me. I'm going to live for you. I love you, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Tell me what to do. Thank you, Jesus.
Somebody said amen, amen, and amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. My heart. Yeah.